investment bank in PA. And um, I was reporting to this lady. She seemed very nice to me. But along the line, she would go back to my boss and to the superior and say things about me. So I kept getting into trouble without knowing why. Until one day, one of the directors actually called me and you know, brought up an issue and I explained it. And from that day onwards, he would always want to hear my own side of the story before making a decision. So I saw that guy as somebody that was you know, was looking out for the interest of anyone that was oppressed. He didn't like to see people oppressed. And because of that, we became very close as like friends. I will go to his office. He was a director. He, didn't have, he wasn't staying in my office, but we needed to interface with him often. So one of the days I went to see him, he was like, let us hang out. And I looked at it, hang out. What bad could come out of hanging out? I don't drink, I don't smoke. And, you know, what bad could come out of it? So I obliged. He gave me an address somewhere in VI to come over. And I went there. I was new in Lagos at the time. I really, really know so many places. So I went to the address and I realized it was his personal guest house. When I got there, I, I wasn't actually afraid. I didn't, nothing actually came to my mind. And um, we got there and I, we started gisting and he was asking me about work and all that. And somewhere along the line, he tried to kiss me. And I was trying to be in the middle of being very rude and still, you know, refusing. And by the time I was saying no and no, he now became very aggressive. And he raped me. I struggled with all my strength, but he raped me. And going through that trauma... It was a very difficult moment for me because just a few years before that time, I was in a relationship from, second, from university and we were engaged to be married. And because I had dwindled from my faith, I was born again when I got into the university. When I got into that relationship, I began to do the world standard of dating. You know, one leg in the church and one leg, you know, you know, the standard of dating. So I had come to a point where I just kept feeling the grace of God leaving me. And I made a resolution that I wanted to stand and serve God with all my heart. And at that time, it was just, you, you know, I had actually broken up that relationship because of my, my faith. And I came to Lagos year in and year out. I was not involved in any relationship. I made up my mind to keep myself. So when this thing happened, it was really traumatic for me because I had succeeded for a couple of years and I was having to deal with that. While I was going through that trauma, I couldn't tell anybody. I couldn't tell my colleague. The only person I told was that same boss of mine that used to, you know, put me into trouble. I, I was really distraught. So I went to her. You know, she saw me really sad and she spoke with me and I told her, but I didn't tell her who it was. But it happened on the 22nd of December and the few weeks after, on the 31st of, um, of that same month, I went for crossover service and I was burdened. I had so much pain in my heart. I just needed to cry out and I cried to God that in that service and I repented I asked God for forgiveness because I kept blaming myself for obliging that visit and as I kept crying and begging God for you know to cleanse me to help me to heal my heart you know I came back from that service really you know feeling you know, free because I was I could get myself back again because throughout that period when this happened it was like I was you know going crazy a car would actually almost knock me off. The whole incident just kept playing back in my mind and the trauma was unbearable. So I was going through that incident when I got back on the 1st of January and I was in my room and I was feeling uncomfortable. So I was like, maybe what's happening? I said, maybe it's because I've not been involved in such an act for such a long time. That's why my body's responding this way because I was feeling some a lot of pain and discomfort so I now walked down to the hospital just a few way, the streets away from my place and the doctor did some tests I told him what happened and he did some tests and he said well um, if it is what he's saying it seems like I'm pregnant but it's actually too early for him to dictate so I may have to come back some few days after and check or do a scan and I went back again and they realized I was pregnant and the trauma of it at that point, I thought the rape was bad, but this, I 
never imagined it in my life because when I was growing up, I remember I used to always tell myself, I said, if very the day you ever try having an abortion, that's the day you die. And I was one of those names, those children, they used to train other people's children. I was very, I, I don't... I don't, I'm not adventurous. I think I analyze my movement. I do everything as one that has wisdom. So at this point, not in my secondary school, my primary school, my university, now I'm working. This is the time that such a thing is happening to me. I was really, really down. And while I was thinking of what to happen, I was saying my, par- my parents will kill me. I was really, really down. And then he kept trying to talk to me. He kept trying to call me. I wasn't picking his call. One of the days he called the office because he was just a director of the company, not a personal staff. He called the office and I had to talk to him because he went through the phone. And when I called him, when he called me and I said, tell him, I broke out into tears and told him what the outcome of what had happened was. And he said I should come and see him. So he, I went to see him in his office and, you know, I told him what it was and he would just allow me you know, cry and cry and cry and then you say, oh my God, your parents are going to kill you. And then I will cry, I will scream out even more. The pain would, even, you will aggravate me. It got me to a point where, when he got that, it got me to a point where I was really, really in so much pain. He now told me, well, there's a way out. I have a friend that can actually help you and, you know, it will be our own little secret. Nobody will know. It will just be our little secret. And I thought about it. Nobody will actually know. My parents won't know. People that have known me all the years will not feel that I was pretending all this while. They would, you know, it was just an easy way out. So I thought about it. He gave me an address to where, you know, his friend would do the procedure. And I went to the hospital. Why I went to that hospital? I was, you know, I remember on my way going there. I remember that word I used to say. The day you ever try doing this, that's the day you will die. I remembered it and I asked God, I said, God, you know it's not my fault. It's not my fault. This thing happened to me. It was not my fault. Just forgive me. And I just said that and, you know, I went ahead. When I got there, the doctor, you know, put, you know began the procedure. And at some point I was unconscious. I, you know, I, I remember I just said, Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do. And I became unconscious. And then the seconds that followed, I died. I saw myself lying down in the same hospital and I was lying down there and I was standing and I could see two of me standing. I couldn't understand. How can I be the same person standing and also be the same person lying down? While I was trying to understand two of me, I, 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 I've been in this earth for a very long time. I don't, I've never seen myself in two places. And I was trying to understand it. In the seconds that followed, I got caught up in the air. And I said, rejoice. I said, oh, thank God, because I know heaven is up there. But as I was rejoicing, as I was heading up, the next day I started heading down again. I got, we said heading down, it was a, it was a pit. The walls of that pit, it was gross darkness all over. It had a wall stretched out from the face of the deep. You could not see the end of it up, neither could you see the end of it down. And it had cell-like units, compartments, and it had a covering. You could see the kind of poles that time might make in the ground. That was what was covering the walls of those gra- the, the, that cell. And I was wondering, I was asking myself, what am I doing here? What's happening? Where? What's happening? Everything was happening in, in flashes. I was asking myself, what's happening? What am I doing here? And before you know it, I found myself on the other side and it was in that place I realized what was happening the first thing I saw was a woman that woman she had been burning for 100 years and she melt she was burning for 100 years if you look at the, li- the, the fire that liquid fried fire that is like magna from a volcanic eruption. She will melt off and she was crying with every strain in her and acting over a second chance. And she will form back again. And she just kept crying and gnashing her teeth. As I was looking at her, it was no longer about what I was looking at. 
The fire began to ravish me from my head down to my feet. I began to burn and I began to cry and I was screaming with every strength in me. I was begging God for a second chance and I was crying out loud. It was in that place certain scriptures became very tangible to me. When the Bible says there will be gnashing of teeth, I found myself gnashing my teeth. I was crying it and I was screaming and my shouts were loud. If I shout now, the next shout will be louder but this energy has it keeps depleting but your shouts keep increasing. I was screaming. Everybody was screaming. Everybody was begging God for another chance. As I was shouting and I was begging God, I remember a few things that occurred there. Some of the things that were traumatic and were traumatic for me were the fact that if you just imagine that everybody was shouting the noise there was enough was like bomb blast blasting off your ears if there was no fire if there was nothing there just that noise was enough to bust your ear balls but you wouldn't die then imagine you cannot breathe you hold your nose for one hour you cannot breathe but you cannot die it was bad and it was painful I realized as I was going through all these experiences I realized the smell the stench in that place if there was no fire if there was nothing else just that stench was bad enough and in all this I realized one of the worst pain that I encountered there was the fact that I knew that I was damned, I knew that it was over, I knew there was no hope, that was the worst trauma of it all the feeling of hopelessness when you know that you are doomed no matter what situation you are you can actually be sick with your body being rotten. As long as you have life, you have hope. You can actually be in prison, sentenced to death. As long as you have hope. As long as you have life, you have hope. But in that place, I knew beyond every reasonable doubt that it was over. That there was no way out. And I was begging God and I was asking God. I said, God, if you can only give me even one second. I'm not asking to come back and live on this earth. Just one second to say Jesus is Lord and die back. I was begging God. I said, God, I don't even mind if you give me, if I come back. And I come back and I'm lying down. I don't have hands, I don't have legs. I'm eating shit and drinking peace. And people are stamping on me. Just the opportunity to come back and restore my ways. It's enough for me. He asked me, I told him, Lord, it's not my fault. And he said, you made a choice. And you were here because you made a decision. And I kept begging. Everybody was begging. And everybody is still begging there. One of the scriptures that also became tangible to me. The Bible says, blessed is he that believes. A lot of people want to see before they believe. But if most of them saw, they know that hell is real. They are in the belly of hell. But it's over. They cannot make a choice now. Because they wanted to see before they believe. I kept crying and I kept begging God and I was asking God the same way everybody was begging God I asked God for oh, just one second just one second and he asked me a question he said how many seconds are in a minute how many minutes are in an hour how many hours are in a day how many days are in a month how many months are in a year how many years have you spent on this earth weigh those seconds those seconds in those years with this one second you are asking me which of them is greater why is this one second now more important to you than all those years and I was helpless and I kept begging every other person was begging I asked God, I said God I never, I knew I preached heaven and hell when I was in secondary school when I gave my life to Christ. I was one of those students that believed that Jesus is coming now. Those radicals. I always knew heaven and hell was real. I preached it. But I never knew it was this real. And I asked them. I said, why is it that this thing is so real? But we live our lives like it doesn't exist. And he said that's the trick of the devil. He blindfolds our minds so that we are busy chasing what is not important. And at the end of it all, we realize what is important, but we do not pay attention to what is important. 
and I kept begging. Every other person was begging. I realized another scripture that says a living dog is better than a dead lion. As long as you are alive, you can make a choice for where you're going to. But once you close your eyes from this earth, it is over. I asked God as I was crying, I was begging, everybody was shouting with all their strength, asking for mercy. I asked him, I said, God, I preach this thing. Let, just give me this opportunity. Let me go back and preach. Let me go and share this news with other people because I don't... He not asked me a question. He said, Jesus, the Son of God, came, but the world did not believe him. He said, the book of Revelations was written for the world to read. But they don't read it, let alone believe it. He said, many have come back with warnings for the world. He said, they don't listen. Why would they listen to you? I said, God, you don't understand. I will come back. I will tell everyone and anyone that has ears that it happened to me. And in seconds I followed. I found myself heading back. We got very close to where the hospital was. And then I woke up in my body. Fear gripped me for some days. I felt the only thing I needed to do was just to lock myself up, just be worshipping God and just worshipping Him so that maybe if I eat, I will still be in sin. By talking, I will still sin. So I just wanted to lock myself. And He said, no, I put you up so that you can come and sound the warning. A few weeks after, I went, I, used, I was so desperate. I would go about, Jesus is coming. Jesus, I, but I was, I was sharing it like somebody that was crazy, like somebody that was mad. But I couldn't tell people that have known me over the years because I didn't want their reputation. I didn't want them to have a wrong reputation of me. And then one day, the Lord told me, he said, for the same reason you died in the first place is the same reason you will die again if you do not go and warn my people. He said, if you love your reputation more than me, you do not deserve me. If you love your life, you will lose it. If you lose it, you will gain it. And I cried, I cried to God. And after that day, I received boldness. I found myself in Dominion City and I received the grace and the boldness to share it. Even though it was a struggle, I received the grace to share it. But one of the things that happened to me, which is why one of the grace that happened to me, one of the last scriptures that became tangible to me, why everybody was begging and crying for God to have mercy on them. They were begging for one second. One second is tick. One minute is tick, 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 60. One second. One of the things that became very tangible to me, it says, I have mercy upon whom I have mercy upon. When I die, God gave me a second chance just because of his mercy. Every other person that was born in that day is still born in today. But I'm here by His mercy and by His grace.